Hello, and welcome to Medieval Lols, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. I'm Mary Wellesley. And I'm Irina Dumitrescu. And we're both writers, literary historians, and contributors to the paper. In this series, we're asking, was the Middle Ages funny? And to do that today, we're looking at a thousand-year-old riddle collection that probably suggests that life in a medieval monastery was not quite as sober as we might imagine. So, Irina, can you just uh, set us up and tell us something about the place of riddles in Anglo-Saxon culture? Sure. So I think, you know, the first thing we have to know is that literate people in early medieval England were usually literate in Latin first. Um, So they're having to learn this language that is foreign to English, that is, you know, a different language family. And so you have all kinds of learned people interested in writing grammars and writing all kinds of help, helping aids, uh, works on rhetoric, works on meter. They're really interested in learning Latin um, because Latin is the key to reading scripture. That's the thing. And if you are, if you are a monk or a bishop or a priest, um, that's probably something you want to be able to do. Um, but there's something particular about England in this case. They really, really loved riddles. And riddles have a long tradition. They're an ancient form. I think a lot of people would know uh, the Sphinx riddle to Oedipus. Greek oracles tend to speak in riddles. There's some ancient Greek collections of riddles. So this is, you know, it's an ancient form. And there's often, it's often had this sort of spiritual aspect to it. Um, In the Bible, you have the Queen of Sheba traveling to meet Solomon and quiz him with riddles. Um, and later Midrashic literature provides that the, the riddles which were um, which are not named in the Bible. And the Romans don't riddle quite as much as the Greeks, but one of the important texts for us and for the Anglo-Saxons is uh, a work from the late 4th or early 5th century by a man who's called Symphosius. Um, he, it's basically a collection of 100 riddles in Latin hexameter. And... They're on different kinds of objects or natural phenomena, and they're not actually meant to be guessed. So in the manuscripts we have, they travel with the solution. So you're more supposed to admire the wit um, of the description. We don't know who Symphosius was. Um, He may have been from Roman North Africa, and the name itself is a play on symposium or drinking party. So he may just be... (laughs) He may be the party guy, you know, and the idea would be that at a party you would drink a lot of wine and then and then tell these riddles. Um, he becomes really important in early medieval England, and you have all kinds of learned men who do their own versions of this. So Aldhelm, the abbot of Malmesbury, this is in the 7th century, writes his own riddle collection. It's 100 riddles in Latin, and they're modeled on Symphosius. And he, his also have the answers with them. Um, Boniface, who, you know, was known as a bishop, who was martyred in Germany, um, uh, wrote his own set of riddles on didactic topics. And they're acrostics, so each, the beginning of each line spells out the answer. So again, this is like a thing that learned men do, um, possibly to teach with, possibly because they like, they like the genre. And then um, a little later, we have a couple of um, riddle writers we don't know very much about who seem to have kind of worked in concert. One of them was Tatwin, um, who wrote a collection of 40 riddles, uh, some of which echo passages from scripture. So this is why I think they, they have this didactic purpose, right? They're meant to help you understand the Latin language, understand grammar better. Some of them are on grammatical topics and understand the Bible. Um, And then Eusebius, um, who knew Bede, for example, um, wrote 60 to complete um, the first 40. So they like, that's the other thing, they like to have them in sets of 100 because Symphosius wrote 100, so that's just the number of riddles you want to have. Um, So this is the picture. You know, you have a lot of these Latin riddles, um, and there are other collections I haven't mentioned, that are circulating around um, in England and also beyond, also on the continent. And um, they're just quite popular. Some of them don't have answers, but usually they do. Usually it's, it's about the intellectual engagement with them. Then we have the Old English riddles, which are a little bit different. What you've described doesn't sound like very rich comic territory. No. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm assuming that those Latin collections are not, they're not that funny or, 
or they are. There are moments of kind of slightly muted humor or... Uh, they're mostly not very funny. Okay. No, they're, you know, they're more serious. They're, um, they muse on qualities of nature. So, you know, they like to kind of pay attention to the paradoxes in nature. Things like the fact that ice turns into water and then turns into ice again. So that becomes a kind of... Hilarious. Know, my, yeah, my mother gives birth to me. Um, so, uh, you know, they're not, they're more about looking, looking at nature and at crafts and at the world in a poetic way. Yeah. They're not really funny, but some of them, some of them have suggestive little elements, um, that you have to read very closely into the Latin. They're not really right up front. And that's also a way that the English riddles are a bit different. So the Exeter book, we've we've mentioned it before in this podcast. It's a collection of verse um, from the 10th century, probably put together in a monastic context. So we're thinking of monks as the primary audience for these riddles. And we have three groups of riddles in the Exeter book. There are different kinds of counts, but they're almost 100, depending on, on how you count. And they're in Old English verse. And one of the big differences is that they don't have answers, which is wonderful if you are a scholar of this topic because you can get a lot of publications proposing different answers to the riddles. This has been a great boon to our field. Imagine if they all had answers and we had nothing to write about. Um, and so, you know, with some of them we know because they're based, their translations or very closely based on Latin riddles that we have so we can tell um, what was probably meant. We have one like that today that we'll talk about. Uh, but with others, you know, some of them are quite obscure or difficult, and there are all kinds of potential answers for them. And that is, you know, this collection is not as unified. They're, they're somewhat different from each other. They often have a line at the end, like, say what I am called, zaga chate, or say what it is called. So there's a kind of call out to the reader to solve it. And you know, there have been so many arguments are things sort of, are they common riddles, you know, folk folk riddles that have been incorporated by these monks into this collection? Um, there are all kinds of theories, but I think we could sort of take a slice of them today and enjoy them. Because some of the other texts in that manuscript are, I mean, we've talked about some of them before, but these female-voiced laments, and we have poems like The Wanderer or The Seafarer that listeners might know. I mean, those seem to be texts that they appear kind of more ephemeral and more rooted in a kind of, you know, if I can call it this, a sort of vernacular culture as opposed to a sort of monastic mm. Latinate culture. And so where do you sort of see the riddles as sitting kind of on that continuum, if that's a good way to conceptualize it? Well, I think that's the thing. A lot of the poems in the Exeter book are pretty enigmatic. I think these people just really loved enigmatic poetry which is part of what makes Old English poetry so much fun to read today, is we often don't know who is the speaker, what actually happened, what's the story behind this. And that's why it's also hard to count the riddles in the Exeter book, because there are arguments made for some of the, you know, what are considered lyric poems or elegies um, to be riddles. I think, you know, my theory is um, these people were getting trained on riddles from day one. And so when they either chose poetry or wrote it themselves, they gravitated towards enigmatic, mysterious, difficult, puzzling poetry. They really like that. Even, even the longer narrative verse has a lot of elements like this. Beowulf has elements like this. They like the feeling of difficult questions being answered and having to muse on them. You know, not so much having everything explicitly, you know, laid out for them in, in a clear story. Um, and is that only the monks or is that does that go beyond the monastic environment? I'm I'm not sure. But I think definitely in these monastic circles, there are also later collections of quizzes and riddles. They like questions and answers. And they like this process of of working something out, of meditating on something and working it out. It feels like that's something that you see across many of the art forms. I mean, if you think about kind of the artwork, so interlace patterns and that you see in manuscripts or yeah. in jewelry, these are incredibly complex patterns that require you to look and relook and try to sort of make out from what appears to be a mess of shapes. And actually, 
you know, it's several animals or, you know, you take something like the Sutton Hoo belt buckle and you can see, th- I think it's like something like yeah. 13 distinct different snakes or beasts within it. Um, and, and it feels like that's something that we we see in, in the literary texts and in the art, you know, that that these are artworks that are produced that require very kind of careful rumination and examination. Well, if you think about it, these people were doing the same thing week after week, yep. right? So they might not have had the internet, but they were they could be just as distracted as anyone today. And so they're finding all sorts of ways to pay attention. And they also have to find ways to pay attention to scripture. And I think that's what the riddles are um, are aiming at a little bit. We can get back to that later. Um, but, you know, how do you pay clo- really close attention to a text? How do you pay really close attention to the world around you? Um, this is what the riddles are. Aim at. at least that's the pedagogic element, but that's not all of it. Maybe there's a pleasure element too. Yeah, I think we've we've perhaps been misleading listeners that what we're going to be talking about is very serious biblical exegesis, but um, that <laughs> that's not what we're talking about, is no. it? <laughs> if you enjoy hearing about medieval literature, you can listen to our full twelve episode series, Medieval Beginnings, right now as part of the LRB's Close Readings podcast subscription. Sign up directly in Apple Podcasts or in other podcast apps. There are links for these below.